We are here today um, to talk about uh, our insights on tax, risk management, especially property. Welcome to our special guest, Susan Fakwa from Keller Property. Thank you. For annuation, investments, employment, NHR, and of course, business advisory. This panel of experts um, give us insights into the current economic and financial landscape that impacts small to medium sized businesses around Australia during this pandemic and beyond. My name is Lisa Garrido. I'll be the host this morning, introducing our panel of industry leaders. Um, I'd like to introduce Ian McLaughlin from Imperium Accounting and Tax. Thanks, Lisa. Good to be here today. Welcome, everybody. Hello again. Um, Susan Farqua from Keller Property. Hi, everyone. Nice to have you. Nice to be back this week. Thank you. That's great. And Adam Lyle from O'Brien Palmer. Yes, that's right. O'Brien Palmer is the one. And thank you for having me, Lisa. Great. So to start off with, why don't we, um, um, Adam, why don't we start with you? Because I'm sure you've got a lot of input um, for this morning's session. Yeah, I do. But before I do, I just want to remind viewers that the opinions and expressions that are made by the uh, industry thought leaders here are purely as general knowledge and are not, not designed for personal circumstances. They're not to be taken as advice uh, or instructions or anything like that. Um, if you need advice or um, uh, information pertaining to your specific circumstances, reach out to the industry thought leaders that are on today's panel. Okay, here we go. We're well in now to the final quarter of this calendar year. We have a budget this week coming up. We have a moratorium extension and we have businesses that are falling off the perch. Why am I talking about all of that? Because I've been banging this drum for six months. And the reality is that with the reduction of JobKeeper uh, and in fact, the reduction of JobSeeker, uh, which I'm sure others will cover. Uh, we do have businesses now that are in particularly in Melbourne are going to be in more trouble than they've ever been. For example, hospitality, for example, retail, transport and logistics. Those three sectors alone are struggling. But then when you add in the, uh, the entertainment, and the leisure industries, particularly anything designed or reliant on tourism, uh, they are particularly in trouble. I'm here at the beautiful Fairmont Resort uh, today, and they have got a COVID safe plan like I've never seen before. They are hitting it hard. But it is only because the New South Wales government is allowing people to travel more than you know, 50 metres from their front door, and I know that's a very facetious statement, uh, that the tourism industry in New South Wales seems to be rebounding. If I was to try and do this in Melbourne, I'd be laughed at. If I was going to try and cross the border, and people who are viewing this today and even on the panel know who I have personal views about this, um, the only border that's really been opened up is South Australia, and Lisa says, Hallelujah. The, the point that I'm making here is that there are four or five specific industries that are mandatorily restrained from doing their jobs. And guess what? Including ours. That where I'm segue for that is that the moratorium restraining companies from being wound up by way of a creditor's petition in the courts has been extended until the 31st of December. Yes, I'll say that date again, the 31st of December. Who on earth in the government is really going to turn that tap on, on New Year's Eve? Happy New Year's, everyone. Go and wind up the people that owe you money as if that's going to happen. It's going to be extended until the 31st of March in all reality. And then guess what happens this week? Hang on, stop the press. We're going to come up with a brand new insolvency regime called Chapter 11. Let's just copy the failures of the chapter 11 in the US and bring it to you to Australia. I thought we had a pretty good insolvency regime called the voluntary administration regime, which when you use it properly, actually works. So I think the reality is that the government know that there is an absolute snowball of insolvencies 
on the horizon. Those who already haven't fallen off the cliff are about to. The budget this week, he's already alluded to it uh, on the program last night, that there are issues that they're facing because of the looming insolvencies. And I made a prediction six months ago, if the viewers remember, that insolvencies in this country are gonna be in the tune of four times the normal amount. That's right, 24 to 30,000 insolvencies in this next year. But they're not gonna start till March because we can't wind anyone up and we can't make anyone a bankrupt. There'll be more to say about this in the coming weeks. What I would like the viewers to read and remember is that getting advice early gives you the best options moving forward. If you fail to get advice and you try and do it yourself, listening to the, the bloke down the pub on Friday night, you're gonna stand yourself into danger. Look after your people, look after your business and look after yourselves. But doing that, you have to get good advice to be able to survive. Tonight on the Four Corners program, and I'm really happy that Liam Bailey from O'Brien Palmer is doing this, is a focus on the impact of the economic stimulus package on Australian businesses. And Liam Bailey is going to be featured on that program tonight. So I encourage everyone to, to tune into that program. Uh, lots of public commentary about um, the reduction of JobKeeper and job seeker. Uh, I think there will be some people that will fall by the wayside. 30% reduction against last year's monthly, average, monthly figures is not an easy threshold to get. So I think there will be some pain to come. And I'm not looking forward to that from a overall social perspective. Personally, uh, I want to make sure everyone knows that they should reach out to help because there are options available, but getting that advice early is absolutely critical. Sorry to waffle on a bit, but I hope that's uh, been helpful. You're muted, Lisa. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you, um, Adam, for that. So Four Corners tonight, O'Brien Palmer will be featured. So for our viewers, please tune in on that. Um, Susan, over to you. All right, so I'm here to talk about property in particular. Colour Property makes recommendations to our clients based on research for investment purposes. So I know that Rob um, focuses on the city market, so I'd like to just cover off some of the things that he would have discussed today. Uh, auction clearance rates this weekend were at 70%, which is down 8% from last year. Um, but if you look at the average uh, house price in Sydney of $1.258 million and an average rental yield of 3.9%, it may not be the best area for you to invest in. And it's really important to look at other regions in Australia because we are seeing some trends start to emerge that are coming from COVID. So just to have a little bit more of a snapshot on Sydney, the vacancy rate in Chatsford is 6%, which is very, very high. Uh, we talk about the vacancy rate um, in terms of supply meeting demand at 3%. So the market is in equilibrium at 3%. Anything under 3% means that there is more demand than there is supply and over 3%, over much greater. So we're generally happy to recommend areas that are under 2.5% and we balk at anything over 3.5%. So 6% in Chatswood is very high. Bondi is 4.5%, Parramatta is 6%. So when you have that much supply on the market, you can see how that will affect demand, especially when it comes to pricing. So macroeconomics states that the market will dictate the prices in a, in a normal environment. So, um, and we're seeing that the prices have dropped enormously uh, in and around the city and pretty much all over uh, Sydney. However, if you go to some other regional areas and some areas that we have been recommending to our clients for quite some time now are Geelong, um, the Sunshine Coast, and Brisbane's Northern Growth Corridor, the vacancy rate in Geelong is 3%, and so the supply meets demand, and the uh, average house price is 538000 Also, you're looking at a rental yield of closer to 4%, which makes sense, uh, makes a lot more sense from a cash flow perspective. And when you, when you think about investing, when you're potentially investing in a time where there are foreseeable economic shocks on the horizon, understanding what your cash flow is is critical. 
The area that's a standout though is the Sunshine Coast. Vacancy rates have dropped from 1.1% earlier in the year to just 0.4% in one suburb called Meriden Plains that I have been recommending. And the average house price there is 529,000 with a rental yield of 5%. And you can see when there is a huge demand and very minimal supply, uh, you're more likely to get more money for your weekly rental income. And at the end of the day, you're really looking for your tenant to pay for your investment. So it's really critical that you understand the numbers that not only go into the drivers of capital growth, but also rental stability. Budrum is another area we love. Vacancy rates 1%. And Joiner, which is in the northern growth corridor of Brisbane in a uh, protected koala corridor, is just 0.5%. And the average house price there is 554,500. And the rental yields there are five to five and a half percent. So what we're seeing is a uh, quite a trend towards regional areas. And I'm particularly seeing regional areas that are about an hour from a, couple, from a capital city having, a, having the most amount of uh, inter, uh, my population migration. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? If you've got three kids under the age of 10 and you're trying to homeschool and work from home and you're cooped up in a Sydney apartment, uh, it's very easy to go, okay, well, maybe the Central Coast is a better plan for me and my family or the Blue Mountains or Wollongong. You can get much more bang for your buck in terms of space, lovely outdoor living and maybe a more stress-free environment. But what we had started to notice just before COVID hit is that there is quite um, an interesting migration pattern of millennials moving to regional areas. Now, this is really the golden generation. That's kind of how we refer to it in, in property because millennials are the ones who are going to be putting down their roots, who are going to be having kids, who might be starting businesses. They want, they're on the way up in their life. They're not on the way out. So that's what we want to see as a trend for stimulating an economy. So these are some of the things that we think about with the macro, uh, with the macro research that we conduct. And the research we do is very extensive. The macro research are the broad trends of and the drivers of capital growth. So things like looking at the economy, the resilience of the economy, is it diversified, is it strong? Uh, what are the drivers of employment? Adam, like he said, the areas that are being that have taken a hit at the moment are hospitality, retail and tourism. Along with mining, they're, they're towns that we don't want to see large sub substantial uh, percentages of the employment represented because they are far more susceptible to economic shocks. If tourism, foreign exchange affects it the most and mining obviously can have huge um, surges and then massive declines and the declines can go for generations. So we're looking at the trends that are really um, driving an economy, but the micro, a lot of people talk about where is the best place to invest from a macro perspective, but they often don't look at it from a micro perspective. In the last five years, a lot of, there's been a lot of news around investing in Brisbane. The only part of Brisbane that has had any real uh, capital growth has been the Northern Growth Corridor, which is the only area we have been recommending for over five years. So it just goes to show that that research helps really pinpoint the right kind of property, so house and land versus apartment or townhouse, the right suburb, and then the region that is set for strong capital growth. It's critical that you get that right in the first cycle of your property investment. After the first cycle, when you've gone through the ups and downs of that cycle, it's really compound interest that's doing the heavy lifting. So I hope that gives you something to think about and maybe something to consider when you are investing in property. It's very easy to think that you know your backyard, but really how well do you know it? You know, what are the, what are the large infrastructure projects, the employment rate, et cetera, and where, where is the employment coming from? Um, so looking to regional areas in particular or other capital cities that have a cheaper buying price and an okay rental yield in this market is something to really consider. Uh, but getting that, doing that research is absolutely critical. So talk to professionals who know what they're talking in this space so that you don't get burned, especially in that first cycle. And especially when we're dealing with an economic shock that you could never have predicted, you know, a one in a hundred year pandemic, knowing that you've got the cash flow, knowing that you're in a highly desirable area, 
that is particularly fed by health and health and education infrastructure is critical. Thank you so much, Susan. That is um, amazing insight. And just to I, I validate your your insight today, um, if um, our viewers haven't already been listening to the news, there is a growing percentage, and it's up to seventy two percent of employees in large organizations are negotiating not returning to the workplace. So as a result, a lot of, like you say, it might be the millennials because those re the research hasn't actually predicted the that generation of, of those um, employees. As a result, uh, more people are looking at, at regional investment or regional homes because they can, um, within an hour's drive, come to their workplace on a rotational basis, but continue to work from home in a much freer, much more stress-free environment. So that, that definitely validates your insight there. Um, and it's something I'd like to elaborate on in next week's um, session at Business Insights in terms of that remote, remote uh, working and what you need in your workplace to continue to sustain a stress-free environment. So there's been a lot of focus in the property markets on the C change and then the tree change. We call this the E change, you know, especially with uh, online businesses emerging and growing and the concept of the four hour work week, you know, but again, everyone has, has come to the same level of maturity almost at exactly the same time with Zoom and Teams and other devices. So, it's really interesting to see yeah. how the trend will continue. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, thank you, Suze. Okay, now Ian, over to you. I know, um, you know, it is September 28th. It's D-Day, pretty much. Um, JobKeeper updates from you, Ian. Thanks, Lisa. What well, is this a significant day? Because today is actually the start of JobKeeper 2.0. So JobKeeper 1.0 finished last night and JobKeeper 2.0 started today. So what does all that mean? Well, basically, people, well, businesses will still have uh, uh, October to lodge their September declarations as part of JobKeeper 1.0. And that will be the last payment that will come through for JobKeeper 1.0. So businesses will have until the 14th of October to lodge those September declarations for JobKeeper 1.0 with the ATO. And just a reminder of what you need to do for that, you need to put your uh, expected turnover for the for the for the following month and your actual turnover uh, for, for that month as well. And then what will happen is JobKeeper 2.0 will kick in. Now, what does that look like? Well, it's a fair bit different to JobKeeper 1.0. So the first payment for JobKeeper 2.0 won't come through until November because it's not covering off until the, the October month. So businesses that are on JobKeeper 1.0 don't need to um, uh, unregister if they don't qualify for JobKeeper 2.0. Businesses that qualify for JobKeeper 2.0, they, if they're on JobKeeper 1.0, they don't need to fill out any more forms. But when they do their declaration with the ATO, they are going to have to tick a box, which basically declares that their actual turnover for their September 2020 quarter was 30% or more down on their actual turnover for the September 2019 quarter. Now, where that's a fair bit different to JobKeeper 1.0 is with JobKeeper 1.0, you had the option of projecting your turnover when you elected into JobKeeper. But this time around, it's based on your actual turnover, okay? So a couple of questions that have come through is what's included in this turnover and how do you calculate it? So I thought I'd just cover off those today. So the first one is, are the JobKeeper payments that you've received from the ATO included uh, in the turnover? And the answer is no. How do you calculate your turnover? Is it based on a cash or an accruals method? Well, it depends on how you report your BAS for GST purposes. So if you report your, your BAS on an accruals basis, then you're looking at your accruals turnover. If you report your BAS on a cash basis, then you're looking at your turnover on a cash basis. Another interesting thing that the ATO has put in there as part of the turnover test is sale of assets is included as part of your turnover. So that's a big one to remember as well. So just a, a refresh on what that payment goes down to. So JobKeeper 1.0, we had the payment, the flat payment for everyone of 1500 a fortnight per employee or business participant. That now drops to 1200 for what we call T1 employees. 
uh, and it drops to 750 for tier two employees. So tier two employees are those that have worked less than 20 hours per week or 80 hours a month. And you've got two test periods for this that you can use. The first test period for your 80 hours, they work in the pay cycle 28 days prior to the 1st of March. If they failed that one, i.e. they didn't work more than the 80 hours, then you can look at the pay period, the 28 days prior to the 1st of July. Okay, so you've got two different test periods you can use per each employee to not nominate whether they are tier one or tier two. Now, a couple of other questions that have come through. You are going to have to let the ATO know when you do your declarations, who is tier one and who is tier two. Zero uh, is not going to release any special buttons which nominate people for being tier one and tier two. Well, that's what they said last week. So I don't know if anything's changed since then. But what is going to be really important is that the, the employers keep really good records of who is tier one and who is tier two. Because although you do not have to produce the information, um, immediately, you will have to produce the information to the ATO in the event of an audit. So it's really important to distinguish between those tier one, in two in, tier one and tier two employees. That's for the first part of JobKeeper 2.0, which runs to the end of December. Now, the second part of JobKeeper 2.0 that runs from January to March, we then have to retest our actual turnover again. And that's comparing our December 2020 uh, quarter turnover compared to our December 2019 turnover. So once again, it's on actual, so it's not projected. So that's a really major key difference between 1.0 and 2.0, that it's all on actuals now. There's no, there's no projected income coming in there. Um, so, but Lisa, I was actually interested to hear from you about the, 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 the fair work provisions on, on JobKeeper 2.0 and what your thoughts were on them. Thanks for that, Ian. I'm actually going to um, go through that. Now, for our viewers, forgive me if you're going to see a set of slides that have a lot of words in them. And the reason why I've done this is so that you can actually take a picture if you wanted to. So that gives you an idea of what the definitions are and what the flexibilities are under Fair Work. So I'm just going to quickly do a share screen. Um, um, Ian, do you want to make me host so I can do that, please? And just for the viewers, it can help to change your view to speaker view. Yes, you could do that too. Thanks, Ian. All right, so I'm just going to go through um, that right now. Um, just want to make sure, can we all see this? Yes, okay, I'm just going to click from beginning. All right, so just so that we, uh, I can uh, put a differentiation. When I talk in, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about qualifying employers and legacy employers. And really simplistically, the definition is if you have um, if you qualify for JobKeeper 2.0, you are called the qualifying employer. But legacy employers are those that have um, received JobKeeper 1.0, 1.0 payments, but are experiencing a 10% decline in turnover. Once again, I'm not going to go through the mechanics of how you qualify for that. That is what you need Ian for and your accountant or your BAS agent, someone you trust to look at that for you. What I want to cover now are the flexibilities um, in the Fair Work Act. So I'm going to cover about five or six areas. So number one is changes to duties and location of work. So it, whether you're a qualifying or legacy employer, these directions must still be, uh, must not be unreasonable. Um, reducing hours um, need to be agreed upon between employer and employee, and it should not disadvantage or have an unfair effect on any of the groups of employees you might have in comparison to other groups of employees. So um, this is still available um, to both qualifying and legacy employers. Now, to become a legacy employer, you need to get a certification and Ian covered this last week in Business Insights. You need to be certified by the ATO as a legacy employer. 
in terms of changes to days and hours of work, so qualifying employees can still reach agreements in relation to changing the days and times of work. Um, and also, um, same with the legacy employers. However, there is a new requirement to ensure that such an agreement doesn't result in the employee working less than two consecutive hours in a day for legacy employers. All right. Um, so that is um, a requirement. When it comes to JobKeeper enabling stand down directions, qualifying employers can continue to issue JobKeeper enabling stand down directions. In the JobKeeper 2.0 regime, uh, 1.0 regime rather, this is called known as the stand down direction. Um, where you can, if you are a qualifying employer, you can reduce the employee's ordinary hours, including to zero, provided that the relevant criteria of consultation and documentation of that direction are met. For legacy employers, you can also issue a stand down direction, except that um, these directions can only take effect for a period beginning on or after the 28th of September. Hey, Lisa, um, we can only see your cover slide and whether you had changed slides or not. Um, oh, okay. Let me just double check why that's happened. Apologies. I don't want to take any um, too much time on this. I'm not sure why. Um, no? Can you see? Is this what you can see? Yeah, we can see the slides, yep. Now, okay, all right, so I'm going to start with this. So as I said earlier, um, that's the JobKeeper enabling stand down directions. Um, and also for legacy employers, you can, can only reduce the employee's ordinary hours to a minimum of 60% of the employee's ordinary hours as they were as of 1st of March this year. OK, so if you've reduced your employees hours under JobKeeper 1.0 to less than 60 percent, you need to make sure that you restructure and budget so that the employees ordinary hours are up to a minimum of 60 percent. Now, of course, the relevant criteria for issuing that direction still need to be met and the direction cannot result in the employee working less than two consecutive hours a day, as I mentioned earlier. And the same limitations apply where a stand down direction is unreasonable. You need to make sure that the stand down is reasonable. Um, wage conditions. Okay, qualifying employers must ensure that their employees for whom they uh, need to give JobKeeper payment are paid fortnightly, the JobKeeper amount, as Ian talked about. Legacy employers do not receive the JobKeeper payment. Okay, however, there is no change to the current law that an employee's hourly rate cannot be reduced as a result of a JobKeeper enabling direction concerning changes in the stand down direction. What this really means is you need to still pay your employees the rate or the award rate as per the duties um, that you actually have been providing them, regardless of whether you change those duties or not. You cannot disadvantage your employees by giving them higher duties, so to speak, and paying them less um, for those duties. Annual leave provisions are the next area that I need to talk about. So um, as everybody already should be aware that annual leave provisions were repealed or are repealed from today. So for those that have um, asked or requested for employees to take annual leave before the 28th of September, you just needed to make sure that there were two weeks of accruals that still remain. But at the moment, there are no extensions to annual leave provisions for anyone. All right, so in terms of the safeguards, um, legacy employers are required to give a longer period of notice than the qualifying employers before giving a JobKeeper enabling direction. So you need to give seven days notice and a consultation period, whereas for qualifying employers, the existing three days notice and consultation period will apply. 
So again, if you are a legacy employer, that is that you have a 10% decline in turnover and you have received JobKeeper 1.0 payments and you're certified as a job a legacy employer, it's the consultation period and seven days notice that is required for this. So just to sum up, for all employers, this is what you need to have a look at. You still need to comply with all the payment obligations and all your employees have the right to request to engage in secondary employment or undertake training or professional development. So those are the real changes um, in the JobKeeper flexi flexibilities under the Fair Work Act. I can send these out on our Facebook page in terms of a slide format for any of our viewers, but I purposely organized this so that you can take a picture if you needed to or a snapshot of the slides. So I'm going to stop that share now um, and go back to, um, oh, let me just see, and go back to our session. So there you go, um, that's um, it for me. Do we have any questions from the panel? Um, to each uh, to each other. I mean, do we'd like to go through that at the moment? So, yeah, Ian, I had, are, you still, are you still with us, Ian, or have you disappeared? Is it just me? He looks like he's either he's dropped out. He's dropped out. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Adam, you had a question. I had a question for Ian, but he's dropped out. So, okay. Oh no, hang on. I think he's back. Could right. be back. Maybe I don't know. We're waiting for that. I've got a question in the meantime, Lisa. Sure. Uh, when, with that provision to uh, reasonably allow for secondary employment, yes. Um, will that, and, and you, Ian may know the answer to this rather than you as well, but will that have tax implications in being taxed a lot more heavily because it's a secondary job? Or is uh, it, are there going to be some provisions for that? Uh, look, typically when you have a secondary, you need to state it in your stat your ATO yeah. statutory declaration. So uh, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a provision for that under the job um, keeper enabling direction because that is a job keeper enabling direction. Yeah. Um, hold on to that and let's see whether Ian comes back to us. Otherwise, we can put that answer on our Facebook and LinkedIn um, pages because I think people would be interested to know that. I, I'm, I don't presume to be an expert with a tax. My, um, my understanding is that you need to uh, tick the uh, when you do your tax law declaration yeah. forms, you need to tick the box that says that you whether you're going to be claiming the tax-free threshold for that particular employment. Yeah. And most people who have a second um, employment uh, tick no for their second one, and then it will balance out at the end of the year when you're doing your tax, because ultimately it's the tax rate for, uh, and I'm not a tax expert, but your tax rate for all of your employment throughout the entire year is aggregated out and then that's what your total tax payable is what determines what your refund will be. Um, Ian will be thinking, shit, I drop off for five seconds and now the guy's making me redundant. But um, <laughs> hopefully I've got that answer right. I'm pretty confident um, that's right. Yeah, Adam, I, I'm, I'm of the belief that that is the case as well. <laughs> but Ian, we just wanted hey, to question... Off, <laughs> the that's question right. Sorry, is that if there's a job keeper enabling direction and employees can take a, can take secondary employment within the tax regime for this pandemic period, is there any changes or amendments as to how the secondary employment is taxed? Would you know, Ian? I think as Adam was saying, look, they're just going to be taxed at marginal rates. Um, yeah. Have I have I dropped off there again? Because all you guys are frozen in my boxes as well. So no, no, we can um, hear. I think that was a question. So so yeah, okay, okay. So everything's just going to continue to be taxed at marginal rates. Okay. And it balances out at the end of the year. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. That's exactly right. Uh, that's, why, know, that's why we do the tax, tax returns. Yeah. And you know, I had a question that came up on my Facebook uh, live feed that said. Uh, about the 20 hour question uh, and they said if they are doing 20 hours in this from basically one October onwards um, do they still need to maintain that or if they were already doing 20 hours pre 23 March do they just qualify as tier one yeah yeah, well, there's, there's basically, the, the, what it states is there's, there's two test periods 
or whether they can qualify as tier one and tier two. So if they work the 28, sorry, the 28 days prior to the period beginning 1st of March, if they work more than 80 hours, then they can qualify as tier one. If they fail that, then the next test period is prior to the 1st of July. So the 28 days prior to the 1st of July, if they then work 80 hours or more in that, then they qualify as tier one. Okay. Well, the thing that I'd like to emphasize to all our viewers is that documentation and um, keeping proper records of, of when you have part-timers, this is absolute key. Um, you really need to look at how your payroll teams are, are, do, uh, are um, yeah. maintaining documentation for this um, and perhaps yeah. um, create someone accountable for this, particularly in this JobKeeper 2.0 regime as well. Ian, I have a question for you actually. If um, businesses don't qualify for JobKeeper 2.0 now in this quarter, that's in the March, uh, December quarter, up to December, um, can they apply using the December quarter figures for the March JobKeeper 2.0 uh, block? Yeah, correct. They, absolutely, they can. So, likewise, if... If, if, no, if, if a business didn't qualify for JobKeeper 1.0, they can still qualify for one part. So they don't have to qualify for the first part of JobKeeper 2 to then qualify for the second part of JobKeeper 2, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, with regards to the legacy employer certification, are the accountants or BAS agents, or I think for small businesses less than 15, they need to fill in a stat deck. Um, do you want to just elaborate on that? Because I'm sure there will be some legacy employers watching this um, this video. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as as you mentioned, Lisa, in your uh, in your piece today, you do need to obtain the declaration, uh, the certificate, if you will, um, from the accountant, tax agent, slash BAS agent, uh, to, to to basically put that in place. So that's what needs to be done. So people that really need to reach out to their accountants to make sure that they get those. <laughs> certificates in place. Great. Any other questions, guys? Suze? No? Okay. Yes, Susan. No, I'm good, thank you. Yeah. Very interesting though, isn't it? Yeah. A lot to keep up, up with for employers. Exactly. And um, so I just wanted to thank all our viewers for um, staying with us. Uh, I know we did a, went a bit over time, but there's a lot to actually cover. Um, watch out for next week's episode on Business Insights. There will be more um, for you to know. Um, so just wanted to thank everybody and our panelists. Don't forget Business Insights. It's where business goes to know. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks.